Welcome, everybody. My name is Bodo Sieber, the CEO of Tag Marshall, and I'm delighted to have you all with us uh, today for our expert session. How Hazeltine National uses technology to increase efficiency and create world-class player experiences. Uh, with me is uh, David Hamilton, our VP of Business Development. Uh, David, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Bodo. And, nice uh, to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. While we were talking about it, uh, um, are you in Charleston right now or in Augusta? No, I'm in Augusta. I'm, I'm okay. close to uh, close to home here, so it's all good. Weather's perfect this time of year, so it's uh, it's, it's not nice to be uh, nice to be in the southeast in this this time of the year. Probably a little chillier where Kyle is, but uh, yeah. but it's nice in Georgia. No putting courses to sleep in, in your hometown there. Um, oh, and uh, of course, uh, importantly, we have Kyle Brand with us, the PGA Head Golf Professional at Hazeltine. Kyle, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great, Bodo and David. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. So we have uh, yeah, quite a few good questions that we want to um, quiz Kyle on. Um, but before we do, I'd love to get the introduction on Hazeltine and obviously also yourself, Kyle, how, how did you end up there in terms of your professional career? And that is quite a lineup. Tell us about uh, <laughs> the club. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, very blessed to be here. I'm, I'm just about to finish my, my second season as head golf professional here at Hazeltine National. Um, again, blessed, blessed to be a part of this esteemed club. Uh, you can see part of our championship resume there. Um, we've got a few other trophies that we're, we're slowly starting to add to the collection, uh, but it's 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 a great place to be a part of, a great membership, a uh, great mission statement, and, and again, yeah, ble blessed to be here. But uh, yeah, my, my path, uh, I grew up about three hours south of Hazeltine in, in a small town in, in northwest Iowa, uh, Okaboji, Iowa. Uh, I went to Nebraska-Lincoln for PGA Golf Management School. Um, but primarily my, my professional life or, or PGA life was all in the south, southwest area. I was in uh, um, Southern California um, for on and off three years at a couple different clubs. Um, and as I, as I said, I, I kind of worked my way up the California coast to get some experience, get some mentors. Um, but yeah, I started out at uh, Indian Ridge in, in Palm Desert, California, um, under Charlie Peterson, who's now over at Toscana. Uh, but I worked my way up the coast and I was at Court of All Golf Club um, for, for one full year. Um, and then after that, I went to San Francisco Golf Club for four years um, up, up in San Francisco. So I got some great mentors, great people to learn under. Um, and then, as I said, uh, almost almost three years now, I uh, um, accepted this job here at uh, Hazeltine in, in Chile, Chile, Minnesota. <laughs> Um, wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, you uh, have the the honor of being the only uh, U.S. club to get the nod for the Ryder Cup, not once but twice. And also, you've um, or the the pounds that be within the club have played very nicely with both the USGA and the PGA. So there isn't a single competition. I don't think that you haven't hosted. Um, tell us about the next one that you've got uh, coming up. Yeah, um, as, as you mentioned, we are uh, the co only club in the country to get the nod or, or get the uh, approval to have the uh, Ryder Cup uh, back for a second time. So 2029, that little itty bitty trophy there in the middle, one of the biggest uh, tournaments out of the air. It's kind of unique and, and funny how that always plays out. But uh, we're excited to have that uh, come back in, in 2029. But next year, we're gearing up for that tall, skinny gold one. Uh, the United States Amateur Trophy. Um, it'll mm -hmm. be the 104th Amateur, uh, one of the most prestigious events in the club or in the in the in the country. Um, and we're we're blessed to have it back for for the second time. Uh, we had 2006. Uh, Richie Ramsey was the champion, um, and in that in that event we had Billy Horschel, Dustin Johnson, Ricky Fowler, Matt Kuchar. Um, so we're really excited to see. Uh, how 2024 progresses, you know, in, into the future and, and who comes on property. Um, Nick Dunlap, uh, last year's champion at Cherry Hill, sounds like he uh, is, is going to try to fight for Tiger's championship. Again, Tiger won the junior amateur and then followed up with, with three U.S. amateurs, uh, 94, 95, 96. 
Um, so he's, he's gunning uh, to, to come back. So we're really excited for that potential opportunity. Um, most of the time when somebody wins the U S amateur, they turn pro and, and mm. uh, just bond past it. So he's, he's in a unique category. Um, he's the only him and tiger are the only ones to win the junior and the, and the U uh, S amateur. So the, the next big uh, thing happening right um, right on your hallowed greens there. Um, I know, uh, David, you followed the Ryder Cup, um, I think, every single minute uh, this season. Uh, Kyle was actually right there. Yeah, it's uh, what a great, uh, obviously, it's testimonial to Hazeltine and your members and your and your history and the nostalgia and everything else there. But what a great event. It's uh, always liking it, too. It's like being a, at a world championship of football for golf. You know, it's just, it's such a great atmosphere and just a, an, an incredible um, event that happens every two years. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we will break the curse um, on that foreign soil eventually. Uh, 30 plus <laughs> years is enough, I think, yeah. for, for fans to, exactly, to carry, yeah. that, carry that little trophy. But uh, we'll, we'll keep fighting and, and do our best to uh, put on a great product for for the United States team and um, here on, on home soil. Yeah, I know you will. Um, correct me here, Kai, but I believe the next European stop is Adair Manor. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I was uh, I was in Rome this past uh, September for, for the Ryder Cup. Um, a great, great venue in Italy. Uh, Marco Simone was a, was a tremendous stop. Um, but yeah, in, in four years, it'll be at Adair Manor in, in Ireland. Um, funny enough, there's a nice uh, tag marshal connection because we work with both uh, yourselves and Adair Manor and also the the previous US hosts uh, with Sing Straits. And obviously, uh, fantastic to work with uh, such uh, prestigious clubs and also learn from managers like yourself. Um, before we um, jump on, uh, give us a quick rundown of what... Uh, the club is about in terms of members and guest play and i know that you have the walking man um as part of your logo and part of your brand but uh, you actually have a really active women's section and league as well give us a bit of insight on that yeah yeah we do we've uh, uh we have a great uh, great membership here uh, you know ranging from juniors to women to men um all the way up to some senior players too um again it's a very um, golf rich club, uh, high golf IQ members who just a- appreciate the game. They understand, you know, the integrity and everything that, that comes with the game. Um, and with that said, they love, love to walk. So our, our walking man logo is, is very important. It's very imperative to, to the club and, and how we operate. Um, the club itself is about close to 90% walking. Uh, again, that could be with caddy push cart, carrying your own, uh, whatever it might be on the, on that front. So, uh, we we do have a, a fleet of carts that are that are available to them as well, uh, but we're really close to about ninety percent, and we we love those numbers. Um, again, from a golf course conditioning perspective, it certainly helps us out. Um, but the club, yeah, as you mentioned, um, you know, we we're founded in nineteen sixty two. Um, Totten Heffelfinger, our, our founder, one of his uh, main goals was to make sure that it's an inclusive environment, uh, so women were able to be members from from day one. Um, one of our very first championships, 1966, was the Women's Open. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that our, our first championship, four short years after it opened up, was a was a women's major. Um, and, and as you mentioned too, our our leagues, uh, we do have three women's leagues. We have a nine hole ladies on Tuesday morning. We have a, a nine hole um, kind of after hours league we call it on Tuesday night, and then Thursday mornings we have our 18 hole. Uh, 18 hole ladies so our, our nine hole ladies is about 20 total it ranges from 8 to 16 that'll play on, on a Tuesday morning basis um, but our, our big uh, robust uh, league is our AHL on Tuesday night there's roughly 110 ladies in that league uh, and with our t-sheet being you know just a tea time system we don't do a shotgun except for some of their guest days but we we can get 64 to 68 ladies out on, on Tuesday nights and it's it's a hot it's a hot tea time. Um, you've got to be seven days in advance to get the certain one you're looking for. Um, if you don't, you're hopeful that somebody has a change in their schedule to jump into a, a tea time after their cancellation. So um, we we love our ladies, we love our juniors. Um, it's a it's a club that uh, 
um, just loves to loves to play golf and, and understands everything that comes with it. Um, fantastic. Uh, thanks. And that's why we have you on this panel. So we are uh, looking forward to, to learning more um, about you know, how you use technology and create these amazing experiences for your, your players and the many guests that come through too. Um, David, if I can task you to do a quick introduction to what we do here at Tag Marsh, we've got uh, yeah, about 50 people on and I'm assuming that some of them may not know. Yeah, no, absolutely. But uh, I, I think the uh, the cool thing about this is having lost the product in, say, 2015, you know, we're now tracking over 30 million rounds. We're tracking over a billion data points. And we've got 500 plus partners esteemed like the Hazel teams. As you can see, obviously, the logos, the the PGAs, the Baltus Raw, the Bandons, the Whistling Straits. Obviously, these are all, you know, world class facilities. Um, and we also we we service not only the resort segment, the private segment, the daily fee segment. So I like to say that we truly have clients that have green fees that range from $30 to up to $900, depending upon, you know, the facility. So we, we've got a product and a portfolio that represents basically all of the industry and all the clientele. And then the relationships that we forged with you know, being a provider for the DP World Tour, um, the USGA and the NGCOA relationship, which you'll see some stats shortly and some reporting and some events that have been sanctioned together between those two groups. And the PGA um, section championship, or excuse me, relationships that we have. Um, you know, we'd li we like to try to partner ourselves with not only high-end clientele, but obviously high-end associations that represent the industry and what we're trying to do to better the game and to continue to... Uh, develop a, a world-class experience. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. I think what I what I really appreciate so much is that uh, that we get to work with some of the trailblazers and innovators and the people who really push the industry forward. And uh, I mean, the, the likes of Pinehurst, Valhalla, um, hosting a major now next next season. They've been working with us for multiple years and, and they do push um, the boundaries. They want to obviously um, define where golf management's going and and it's wonderful for us because we get to help them but also we get to learn from them right and then uh, put that back into our system um, and our features and our learnings and how we develop our product and then bring that to the whole entire market spectrum um, much like uh, David has said most of our partners are really just a good club down the road and uh, that $45, $50 green fee golf course or just a, a decent private club and they're, they're all solving the same problem right so um, that's really um yeah we we are very blessed to to be adding value um let's jump back to kyle um we want to talk about uh, the player experience a little bit and uh, obviously you've uh, you've been around the block and uh, managed a lot of rounds of golf and also i know that your family is very involved in the game and really loves the game so um yeah from from your point of view if you had to pick three of this list of experience factors what would you say which ones are the three that are must have uh, for a golf course yeah sure i, I mean again everyone's going to have um you know a, a different grading scale based on what they want in the game um again some people you know they, they just like to go out and, and walk and swing the club chase the little white ball uh but from yeah my perspective um, obviously, I love course design, um, course conditioning. Both of those um, are can go hand in hand. Um, course conditioning, obviously, is I think it takes the cake over over course design. Um, and then and then secondarily, pace of play very very important. Um, mm -hmm. If you're on a course that is a design you love, um, while the course conditioning is great, pace of play may not matter as much. Um, but, but then the, the third for me is, is who you play with. Um, as you mentioned, I, um, my, one of my favorite weeks of the year, I go to Mesquite, Nevada with, with my dad, um, and my brother is now, now going as well, but we do a little golfing and gambling trip, uh, each year. I think this will be my 13th year going. So who I play with is very important to me. Um, course conditioning and course design, I think is, um, you know, right, right up there. So I think all those, those three certainly, um, are kind of where, where it fits for me. hundred percent. Um, David, you've played a bit of golf in your day. Um, do you echo Kyle's sentiments? 
I, I do. I, I think course conditioning and pace and flow of play really is the top two for most um, most individuals. And I think that third varies depending upon, you know, to to Kyle's point, you know, playing partners are extremely important. In some cases, if you're maybe a, a daily fee or a public golfer, accessibility and tee time availability may be more important to you. So cost value, I always say that third one's a little bit of a toss up, depending upon who you're talking to. Yeah, and funny enough, if you're asking what's value to a golfer, they very quickly go back to course conditioning and pace and flow of play very often, right? Like, if that's right, that's value for me. Um, okay, so let's look at what some of the research says. Um, so the USGA is, um, yeah, obviously, they're the custodians of the game, and they're uh, representing millions of players. So, so they found that 74% of players believe pace and flow and time is a crucial enjoyment factor. And there's only two things that rank higher than that. And the first one is, you guessed it, uh, course conditioning. The second one is who's in my group, my playing partner. So, uh, Kyle, you're, you're spot on here. And more recently, the NGCOA has done a golf industry pulse uh, where they're looking at what are the key factors that operators rank that they want to pay attention to that they believe are key to the play experience. And, and they, um, their top three are the conditioning of the golf course. Again, no surprises, um, a welcoming attitude towards women. So Hazeltine, you were trailblazers there, even, um, close to 70 years ago. And, uh, the third one is pace of play with 84% of operators saying we have to pay attention to this. Um, yeah, and then physical beauty, aesthetics of the golf course, that goes back to conditioning design again, and, and then lastly, cost value. So this is obviously a, an extended list, but those are the top five. Um, so your sentiments here aligning. Um, let's, uh, let's jump one deeper. So not too far from where you are up in Minnesota is the University of, University of Wisconsin Stout and also Erin Hills. And uh, the reason I mention this is because the lady here on stage is Professor Christina Schoonover, who works for both. Um, so she's operations director at Erin Hills, and uh, she also is a uh, runs a golf management uh, course at uh, the Uni Wisconsin Stout, and has done a lot of research for the USGA. And in one of those research uh, pieces, they looked at what um, does the player experience consist of, and what really matters to players, um, and they really went very broad broad based uh, spoken to thousands of players and uh, and also did research on site and tracked information at at multiple and very very different golf courses and what they found is that um the experiences that rank top and bottom in terms of the impact they have on players both from a frustration but also from a delight point of view are pace of play related and uh, the bottom one that is the worst thing that can happen to golfers, corrective pace of play actions. Um, uh, David, what do you understand um, when somebody says corrective pace of play actions, when it goes bad? What does that look like? Well, I, I think, first of all, as a, as a golfer for, you know, decades, nobody wants to be told that they're slow, you know? So it's always the group ahead of them. It's always their playing partners. You know, no one wants to acknowledge that. So I think, you know, if you think about the traditional way of, of managing a golf course and having a ranger that comes out, as soon as that ranger shows up, there's a negative connotation. There's a, a thought process of, okay, what did we do wrong? You know, it, it becomes adversarial. And I think that's what really drives this, the whole martial role, the placement, and I think that's where our technology really gives the operator the ability to have that, you know, fact-based conversation and be proactive about it and, and really turn it into a, a delightful experience because it could be something as simple as a one bad hole, you know, or, or you know, something that's, that slowed the group down for a hole, but they're not slow players. They're, they literally, you know, hit a wall on a specific hole. And the last thing you want to do is punish someone for that. So sure. I think it gives us the ability to, to really deal with this in a very proactive and a, and a pleasant manner. Um, to that, uh, the other thing that frustrates players is other people's speed, right? So if other people hold me up, I uh, also can't deal with it as a player. Um, right. Funny enough, this is where uh, Tag Marshall was born. Uh, my business partners were in that seat and they had a lot of time to think about how technology might be able to help um, make golf a bit faster. And uh, lo and behold, uh, here we are. But uh, the, the top um a point scorer here in terms of delight 
to play is this positive ranger etiquette. And that I think to David's point, the marshal and ranger, or even the name marshal and ranger, has got a policing component to it. So if it's a positive experience, that is so unexpected. Um, Kyle, obviously you've uh, you've got your own way of doing things at at Hazeltine. We're going to jump into the technology just now, uh, but uh, tell us about your ranger slash marshal. Does that person even exist? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, and I want to echo um, David's comments too, um, and then add a little to it. But yeah, anytime you see a ranger, it's that negative feel, that negative you know kind of tone of somebody coming up to tell somebody that they're slow. Nobody wants to be told they're slow let alone somebody doesn't want to be that person telling them they're, you know, slow. So there, there's a way around um, approaching it, doing it, doing it in a positive manner and, and trying your best to just, you know, find your way around telling them that they're slow without actually saying it. So um, here at Hazel team, we really enjoy tag Marshall. It allows us to, it allows me uh, you know, the, the professional um, from a budgetary perspective to not, have a ranger on a daily basis. I'm not paying somebody to just do loops around the golf course. Um, you know, we, we all have our, our phones hooked up to tag Marshall. So anytime that there's an issue on the golf course, we get a text where they are, what's going on. Um, I have 10 or 12 staff that are trained into tag Marshall. Uh, so again, it starts with our two golf shop um, counters, our, our, our computers there, they're both loaded up to, um, tied right into four T's. So any update there, um, automatically gets gets dinged in. Um, our starter has a, a Surface or an iPad out on the on the first tee, so I'm handing out tag five um, to me. If I was going to play, they just tag it right to me um, there at the podium. So I have everybody keyed in to understand what the different color codes are, um, all of it. So that way, when we do have an issue, let's say it's hole five, which is a typical issue for us, um, the first four holes can can be um, brutes for sure, and then right mm -hmm. after or you tee off on five and then there, there's our uh the shack our our opportunity to grab a beverage a quick hot dog burger whatever jeff's making there um and oftentimes that is a little um they're a little sluggish getting out of out of that little turn area so they're in turn hole five and hole six can kind of slow down but um, if that does happen or when that does happen uh one of our staff members it could be me could be uh, one of my other assistants we jump out there Again, as soon as a, a player, you see somebody driving a cart without clubs on the back, automatically you think Ranger, oh gosh, I'm going to look in front of me. We got a gap. Oh boy, here they come, right? So that's that's kind of the mentality that uh, the Ranger shows, um, being present um, and, and showing face, mm. I think does 60% of the work for you. you. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything to them. Uh, but if you do, I always just uh, tell my staff to just start with a warm welcome greeting. Hey, guys, how you doing? Golf course is great, isn't it? It's a beautiful day. Um, and then let them chime back in. And then shortly after that, I just instead of saying you guys are slow, say there's a gap that's formed in front of you. Just do your best to try to close it for me. Um, and then I drive away. So it's it doesn't have that negative feeling to them of. Hey, you guys are slow. Pick it up, and then just drive away. Now they, now that experience isn't isn't positive for for that slow, you know, delay or person, whatever it might be. Yeah, I think the the positioning here is is really what matters, right? So you're saying there's a gap in front of you. Please close it up. Other um, managers might say uh, you're a bit out of position, right? Um, and and like you're saying, we're we're telling them they're slow, but we're being nice about it. And we're not saying you're slow because it's very easy for a golfer to compute that they need to close a gap, but it's very near impossible for them to compute that they might be slow, right? It's yeah. it's almost like you have a low IQ um, and let's continue a conversation from here on. You cannot win. They will defend themselves. Um, yeah, you, you jumped uh, into the technology side of things. Um, um, which obviously we want to uh, shine a bit of a light on. Because to you, obviously, this is a, it's all about creating the best possible player experience. And you're also realizing that um, you need to stay on top of things because very often it's a handful of groups that can really impact many groups behind them. And, and to 
um, to mop it up once the damage is done is an, a huge effort and uh, and it's an effort that might take a couple of days actually to correct right because people sometimes they're cooking internally and then three days later they come to you and tell you um, before we look at what this actually looks like at the club um, if I can just ask David again just very briefly um, you know David that obviously the Kyle and the team use the walking tags um, mm -hmm. for and it suits their purposes really nicely given that they want to do lots of walking they have some caddies and they can also uh, clip that onto carts um, as they go um, but uh, talk us through the technology just very briefly and then we'll jump into a live map and look at what Kyle and the team actually look like uh, look at rather at Hazel team yeah absolutely uh, but I, th I think if you look at it from left to right you know the left side being the tag the walking tag that, that Kyle and the team at Hazel team uses you know, that can be easily uh, strapped onto a golf bag, um, a caddy bib, you know, anything of that nature. The the next unit over to the right of that is a smaller handheld unit that can actually be mounted on a push cart or a pull cart. Um, it has the same functionality that our eight inch screen that mounts directly on a golf car has. So you do have the visibility of pace of play, yardage, you know, the components. The If you, you move right in the number two side, um, the eight inch screen, again, it's going to give you that communication piece. It's going to give you the yardage piece. It's going to give you the pace of play for your group. So it's kind of a self marshalling type feature. And then just to the right of that, it looks like a small suitcase is a component that mounts on the golf cart underneath the seat. And that's a very discreet way that a lot of our private clients that maybe don't want a screen, you know, prefer not to have that technology hanging from the golf car. They can mount it under the screen, say, have the same tracking geofencing components, communication, so on and so forth. I think the, the most important part of this is the fact that everything kind of funnels into, you heard Kyle reference, the fact that his starter has a, a, an iPad, you know, on the first tee. Um, everything's web-based, everything's cloud-based, so you can access it from a phone, from a, a laptop, from a desktop, <clears throat> from a, <clears throat> excuse me, a pad itself. And then it all funnels back into what we call our analytics hub. So regardless of what profile of club you have and what technology you're using, you're getting access to the same data and the ability to manage your operation like Kyle does every single day. So you've got visibility, you've got pace of play, you've got group designation, you've got tea time integration, things of that nature. Um, thanks, David. So, yep, um, to... For those of you who don't know, um, a simple way of thinking of it is like it's a ways of Google Maps of of the traffic on the golf course, right? And then obviously there's the back end data that looks at uh, a bit more of the detail, like whole whole runtime and and how the uh, the time periods have gone from uh, with a number of um, of metrics. Um, let's jump into a Hazeltine live map here. Um, so this is what things might look like on any day. Um, it's quite busy out there. Uh, we have staged this because obviously uh, um, play, pace has, uh, sorry, the play has slowed right down now. Um, so we can't look at a, at a live map. Um, and now I've clicked on to one specific group and it's the biggest one on the screen, group number 17, and it tells a bit of a story. Uh, but uh, Kyle, from your side, um, what, what do you see here? And, and obviously your team that's dialed into this, they know exactly what's going on at a golf course, at, on your golf course at a glance here. Uh, uh, tell us a bit about the color coding and uh, and how your team then uses that to to go out and, uh, and manage things. Yeah, um, again, this is a perfect um, kind of perspective or, or, you know, aerial view of the earlier discussion as well. But, um, you know, when we, when we look at it, uh, obviously green is good in, in our, our opinion. Green means they're on pace. Uh, they're not affecting anybody. Um, should be four happy golfers out there, whatever it might be. Um, but then when you look at 17 and the enlarged um, number compared to some of the others, that, that to us is our, our issue group. Um, that, is, that is the delayer. So they are going to hold up people behind them. And you can see the colors changing on 18 and 19. Um, slowly behind them. So 17 um, is our issue. Um, they're the ones that we need to go out and talk to um, and, and try to make sure that they are, as I mentioned, closing the gap um, from 17 and 16 because um, there's a little little gap that's forming um, and that's just where we would go out and talk to them. And most likely we'd catch them on 
you know, six fairway or six T. Um, but that, you know, we'd get the text message alert just stating, hey, 17 is, you know, they're six minutes behind their, their pace, uh, but they're, you know, looking like they're going to be worse. Uh, as you can see on that uh, progress area, holes one and two, they're in the green, they're good to go. And then three, four, five, they start just losing ground. Um, and, and again, in that location where, where tag 18 is in the orange, that is where our, our shaft is located. So again, it's kind of that pinch point. It's that, that sluggish out of the gates on five. Um, and that's just our typical area where we have to go, go talk to people. So uh, it's a great opportunity, you know, within that first third of the round uh, also to make sure that they're, they're keeping pace. If they get into, you know, 10, 11, 12, and they're still in the same spot, uh, it's just going to progressively get worse and they won't hit our four hour and 10 minute goal. Um, uh, thanks, Carla. I know that you've worked with quite a number of uh, T sheets and club management systems over time. Uh, uh, tell us a bit about the, the four T's integration and, and uh, is it helpful for your team to know who's in the group? Um, uh, yeah, given that you obviously really want to look after your, your players and personalize uh your service as much as possible yeah uh, as you mentioned at, at my previous clubs it's uh, I, i've i've worked with a number um of these companies club profit golf genius club essential jonas previously uh so it's great to see that you guys integrate with with so many i think that's a huge positive uh but here at hazeltine we utilize four t's um for our t-sheet system we actually do have them in our, our pos system now as well uh but they're a great um, hands on, uh, they integrate well. Um, as you can see here, if there's a if there's a cancellation or an addition, uh, it'll pop right in and, and populate into Tag Marshall. Um, so it's it's great that we don't have to. We can just integrate you your team and you and your your product with the previous product we already have. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that would be positive because Four T's is, in, in my opinion, one of the leaders on the T sheet front. Kyle, I just if I could add real quick, I, knowing your golf course and kind of what you've referenced here, the the cool thing about this is, as you said, you've got a you've got a shack on the fifth hole, you've got a little bit of a slow point, you know that you've got the difficulties of those first four holes that you mentioned, or first five holes, and you know this is a great example of of this respective group that might have just hit a wall, had a couple of errant balls on the fifth hole, and so now you're going to send a marshal out there or a course advisor. And you're going to have a conversation to scold them or something of that nature. Obviously, that doesn't go over well. So I love the fact that you've got, you know, the, not only the knowledge ingrained and the culture ingrained into your staff. So, you know, to usher them, hey, there's a little bit of a gap. If you guys could pick it up, it would be really helpful. Just a great way to, to manage your operation. Yeah, and and the one thing I didn't didn't mention at the shack is it's uh, later this year I added in uh, two pace of play clocks. Again, those clocks are set back in time. So as you as you grab your burger, your slider, your beer, uh, water, Powerade, Gatorade, whatever you're grabbing there at the shack, when you walk through our little breezeway, there's a clock that isn't obviously matching the current time. But if you're if you're walking through there and you're matching your tea time, you're good to go. Um, and, and the members kind of understand that, but if they're five minutes behind or 10 minutes behind, that's a quick alert to them to say, Hey, um, you know, we need to, uh, we need to pick it up. And, and we do have a fair number of, of members who do bring out clients and sometimes having that discussion with, with one of their clients too, that, uh, uh, you know, they're slow. They appreciate us coming out and being that individual that tells them. But I think the, the pace of play clock itself, too, is also an, another point of a conversation piece of somebody saying, well, that clock's not right. Well, glad you noticed it. We're five minutes behind. So yeah. it, it, that does help us as well. But, uh, yeah, cool. just just having having this having uh, tag marshal in place, uh, again, gives us the data, it gives us the ability to say this isn't my biased opinion that you are slow. The data is speaking for itself. We have all of these things in place. And, and currently, if you keep up this pace, group 17, you won't finish in four hours and 10 minutes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, um, interesting. The The concept of the uh, the pace clock is obviously what basically what we put onto our eight inch screen, right? So the, the player is constantly reminded and they get the exact same colors. So they would know they're um, either 
they're fine, they're on pace, or they're falling out of position, they're delaying others. So having that awareness, I think, uh, does makes a big difference. Much like you're saying, coming out of the shack, you either you know you're good, or you know you need to pick things up. And uh, the the more transparency around that, the more communication around that, that the better. Um, I know that uh, this is uh, this is an example here of uh, what we call our, our player profiles, where because obviously if we're feeding in player details, we can now create profiles on those players. So over time, um, that might be a season or it might be all time. You can then see uh, who floats to the top in terms of their quick players or who uh, drops to the bottom in terms of their risk and they're often delaying others. Um, and then the other thing that's uh, often useful when it comes to having conversations is the what we call our track map, which is basically a history of every round that was played. Um, and it tracks the start time, end time, time stamps um, during the round, also what was their pace status at any time. And uh, it also tracks geofence breaches, any sort of interventions and actions with the team. Uh, Carl, tell us a bit how how you use that um, in managing, yeah, because obviously your members, you've mentioned um, you love them and they have a really high golf um, IQ, but every now and then there might be a, um, an educational conversation necessary. How, how does that data help you uh, do that? Yeah, you know, I, I think the track map is great to be able to, again, it's just one player in the group that has has the tag. Uh, but I think the one thing that we could do better in is every time we have an interaction or as you guys call it, the intervention um, to just log it and put it in there and then find out how that initial discussion or second discussion or third discussion with that group, whatever it might be. Um, how does how does our interaction or our interventions actually improve um, and we can collect that data. So I think that's something that I'm really going to dive into next year. Um, given we have a slow pace of play next year. Um, but I think the data here is, is tremendous. Um, you know, there's a, there's a misconception that uh, if we gave it to uh, Peter Gunnarsson all the time, he feels that, you know, he's just being watched. Um, and, and that's kind of some of the education that we can do with the members too. But this data is great because now, again, I, I'm not coming off as a biased individual and telling them they're slow it's just great data and if they did have a have a lost ball or whatever it might be this track map would show that they're off into the weeds on the right of 10 or wherever they they might be uh, so all of this stuff is is very very important for for me to be able to relay to somebody um, you know for me to send them a note tomorrow uh, and say that your group was slow. You guys finished in four hours and 26 minutes and they come back at me and say, well, actually we finished in 412. I was, I was, you know, checking it on my watch. Then I can go to this track map and I can go to say, yeah, thank you for your feedback. But unfortunately this is what tag Marshall's showing me. I'm not trying to be biased here. It is point blank right in front of them. Um, and it's just easier communication on our front, um, you know, to be able to tell somebody that they just need to improve what they're doing. Yeah, Kyle, I think we like to say that this gives you, and I, and I appreciate if you agree or disagree, but this gives you the ability to have that non-emotional fact-based conversation, mm -hmm. you know? Correct. Yeah. Um, just jumping back at the the player uh, profiles, I know that this is something that you actually asking our team um, for a bit of help with here or there, just segmenting some of your leagues, which we'll talk to in just a minute. Um, but if you, and obviously you've spoken about the efficiency of not needing a ranger um, in terms of that role, you guys can do this as needed because the system tells you where to go and, and you don't need to spend hours and hours looking for problems. And so we covered some of that, but uh, um, tell us a bit how you use some of the analytics and the data in your management and also maybe your reporting uh, to um, to your committee? Yeah, again, I think it all, you know, doing doing our best to use uh, every um, facet of your your guys' product here. Um, you know, I, I think when we look at, look at items on here, obviously groups tracked, um, you have that middle bar graph. Obviously the morning rounds, the morning rounds will typically be really good, right? They don't have anybody in front of them. There are rabbits. And typically those individuals are people that love to play fast. 
Um, so they'll most of the time always be green and then they'll progress throughout the day. The wind picks up, whatever might happen on the golf course. Um, somebody loses a few balls, it's just not their day. So then you see that, what is that, that seventh or eighth group turns into red. Um, and, and it's just to, to be able to pull this data is great. You've got some interventions there at the end of the day, but those interventions talking to them was something that happened earlier in the day. Um, I really do love the the hole by hole, uh, hole status that we have down there, kind of in that bottom left. Um, that way, I'll take all this data through this year and I'll adjust and tweak our hole by hole to make sure that we're, you know, it is 14 minutes to play number one or number three is 17 minutes and we have it at 15. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll tweak some of our items based on this feedback and data. Um, Jack, John, and the, and the team you guys have there, they've been great to work with this year. Uh, one of our issues um, in pulling this, this historical data was uh, one of our, one of our leagues, uh, they, they typically were just slow. You know, they're, they're an 11 o'clock to one o'clock timeframe the, the, the soul of the day, the, the most important part of the day. Uh, and they just, they just were a little slow. So I used this data, Jack and John, again, I, I mentioned they, they grabbed uh, reports for me every month. So we would tag these leagues. Uh, and then every day we'd, we'd look at it. We created our own, our own spreadsheet that we give to their, their league captain um, to tell them if we don't see improvement, on our pace of play, because you're affecting one o'clock to, you know, five o'clock the rest of the day. If we don't see improvement, uh, we're going to have to go from foursomes down to threesomes uh, just to make sure that our pace of play is, is, is correct. And, and we're under that four hour, 10 minute threshold. Um, so those reports were awesome. Again, that, that uh, conversation we had with them was smooth. It was easy. It was understandable. Um, just using these reports um, is great. So we do have, uh, excuse me, we do have um, a, a bi-weekly um, eagle that we call it that goes out a newsletter. Um, it'll go out to the, the whole membership. Um, and the very first one of the month, uh, we use these reports uh, that Jack sends to us uh, and we send it out to the whole membership to show them the month of May, we're at four hours and nine minutes. Great. Keep it up. Here we go. Uh, but then there's areas where we can still improve and, and deciphering that data of you know the monday is quicker than wednesday or tuesday is slower than thursday and then you guys dive even deeper and you go into the hour segments which is super super helpful um in having these discussions yeah i'm um, i'm jumping into this now this is actually your um october or your season to october and it shows how quick your day starts like you said 335 right um, and then you have um, yeah, the balance of the day is round roundabout where you want where you want it to be, but obviously the early start balances out your average times. Um, and that's uh, yeah, normally what what we like to see. But what it really does have what what it is helpful to you is obviously you can then um, dedicate more attention to key hours of the day. And much like you've learned, there are key areas on the course that you need to pay attention to. And the more um data you have on that the smarter you can obviously manage things and this is your average round time for the entire season including uh, all the leagues and uh, all the tough setups that you've had you're coming in at four hours 12 versus your 4 10 goal time and well done to the you and the team that you're getting through virtually 70 percent of your rounds on pace that is really really good um and uh it's great to see also that you have almost 4,000 interactions with the system that make that all happen, right? So it doesn't happen by chance that you deliver on that. You have to put in a bit of effort, uh, but I think you guys are really dialed in um, very nicely. And that senior league that you mentioned that uh, you, know, you were grateful for having additional information, what, what this little pie here shows is that 6.7% of them were delayers, delaying about 25% of the uh, of them the groups behind and this is a picture that speaks volumes to it's a few groups impacting others right um and you have to just stay on top of them and i know that obviously we didn't want to show the the player profile slash like but you have all the data on all of those players in that and uh and that spits out who's 
delaying more often than not. And then you can be specific also around potentially assigning tea times that are less risky um, or you have an educational conversation and it's purely based on data. Like to David's point, it's not confrontational, it's educational and we're here to help you. Um, and uh, you can also uh, stand your ground much easier, right? Because uh, I can just imagine uh, if you don't have any of those, um, how difficult it would be to have conversations. It's all about opinion versus opinion and, and nobody wins. Um, so it's great to it's great to hear that you're making such uh, good use of it. Yeah, again, nobody wants to do, <clears throat> I'm speaking for others, but nobody wants to see that, you know, 26% or uh, whatever that number is there uh, is that the rounds are there because then it, it's a poor reflection on, on us and our, our job, but this is also an opportunity for us to improve, um, for us to use this data and, and speak, um, you know, individually with, with those delayers. Um, if it's, you know, I, I, I did pull some data from one of the end, end of the year reportings and I was able to, I just organized it by percent of their rounds as delayers. We have one member that uh, he's a, he's a new member. Uh, he's, he's a few, a couple months in, uh, I think he, he was tagged five different times and, and three of those rounds, he was a layer. So that's mm -hmm. an individual that we just have a, just a, a great conversation and say, I, I get it. You're excited. You're bringing out guests. Um, the one way that we can improve is just, just focus on pace of play. Um, mm -hmm. Hazeltine isn't the easiest golf course in the world. Uh, you know, it's firm, it's fast. The rough gets to four or five inches. The greens are rolling on average at 13 uh we've got some deep bunkers it's a long golf course uh you know we've we we have multiple tees but the golf course can stretch almost 8,000 yards not that anybody goes back and plays it uh from our members but uh it's just a challenging golf course um and then you throw in you know those october um that bar graph there in october obviously we start losing leaves we start um other other things start to impact and we need to be uh, professional and understanding and, and that, you know, there could have been a lost ball somewhere in the rough. Um, so we certainly do that and, and we do our best to, to make it a, a great, great experience overall and, and continue to, you know, we strive to, to improve. Yeah. And, and I think, um, yeah, Peter Drucker is one of the, I considered a great management thinker. And, and he says, um, if you want to improve something, you have to measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? So for you guys to dial into this level um, is great. And also, this is obviously a um, multi-year uh, of data now that you have. Um, and and for me, it's always wonderful to see that the opportunity that you get with the live management and the live map is one thing, but then to really start digging into the underlying data and also potentially including the superintendents. Um, yeah, why was our... A day a train wreck on this day and why did we have holdups on this hole well maybe we had an impossible pin placement things like that right so just to understand things better um, gives you opportunities to tweak and incrementally improve um, let me just jump back again to the uh, the analytics hub here because there's there's one um, little element down here that we call the pace distribution so we're the, the simple way of looking at your pace is obviously the average round time. Um, but uh, David, I know that this is something that, uh, yeah, that a lot of the partners that, that you work with really value. And how do you read that? And, and what's, uh, what, uh, what can you share about this? Yeah, I think if you think about average round time, uh, we I always like to align it with average temperature and, you know, no different than what Kyle referenced earlier. Your early morning rounds are going to drive your averages and you've got your rabbits that go out first thing in the morning. They're unencumbered. There's nobody in front of them. They're going to play in three and a half, 345. And if you think about and align that with temperature, it can be, you know, even though you might have an average temperature of 75 degrees, it could be 40 in the morning and it could be, you know, cooling off in the afternoon. So when you peel back the, the data and you really uncover what's driving that in a lot of our rounds, even though they may have a four hour, nine or 10 minute round time, you might find that 25 plus percent of your rounds are actually being delayed. They're not on pace. So you've got the opportunity for those individuals to come off the golf course frustrated. You know, so there's there's people that can play within pace and there's and it really is driven by time of day, you know, window of opportunity, 
And to Kyle's point, I mean, it just gives you the ability to look at it in a different light and be able to determine what's driving that. Why are we slower on Tuesdays than we're on Thursdays? Why are we slow in this window of the morning? And that, you know, if you go back to his um, his um, league play, pretty impressive to be within the window of time, Kyle, that you guys are to have that kind of an impact on your, your league play, which you think about, that's the most opportune, impactful window of the day, 1130 in the morning to one o'clock in the afternoon. That drives everything. So to have them play out of pace, you know, is going to put some strains on your golf course and the rest of your membership. So it's uh, well, well done in regard to just addressing it and taking the data and learning from it and continually improving from it. Yeah. And, and you know, I could, Bodo and I talked about this the other day, but I could uh, go ahead and tweak our, you know, and, and not do anything with this data. And I can tweak it to, you know, our rounds are 415. Uh, you know, and then the 412 makes me look better, but, but we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we're, we're continuing to use this data in the right, right light. And, and that certainly, certainly is why we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just add one more consideration here that, um, that comes into play. Like we saw on the next slide, um, very often the early rounds, and that is not just the first round. That's, uh, hopefully the first few, um, are going a bit quicker, um, and what we're finding is that clubs that start to analyze this, they're seeing opportunities for um, interval adjustments potentially, right? Uh, because you can tighten your intervals a bit because people are moving quicker and and many clubs uh, can then start to generate a little bit more capacity that they never had. And that speaks to the accessibility, tee times availability point. And uh, I know uh, Hazeltine obviously is a, a prime address, but I don't think there's a single private club in the golf course uh, in the uh, in the US right now worth their salt that doesn't have a wait list right around the block. So if if you manage this well, firstly your players are happy because they're coming through in a good time. There's no flow issues is no holdups secondly you you can create additional capacity that you never had and with two three additional tea times created that you can safely present that you can happily take on another 20 members right because you know you can accommodate them there's no um, additional competition for the tea time so this is really a uh, an interesting consideration and obviously in the daily fee space it immediately translates into bottom line line revenue and that's really what what we're trying to do um just to make sure that we provide an um a system that feeds and and uh helps that economic engine of the golf course because that's what the golf course is about the service that gets delivered out on the golf course that's how it's remembered and we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to deliver on that um yeah, let's uh, go to our last point. And thank you so much for the good uh, conversation, the great points raised. Uh, what's the response been from your members? Obviously, it's uh, it's not new. You've uh, you've had it now for a few years. Uh, I would guess it's almost part of the culture. And then also, how's your team uh, working with it? Um, and one thing I sometimes like to consider, what if we turned it off? You know, <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, both members and team, um, they understand why we do it. Team, obviously, they're they're the ones that have to uh, grab all of them, and they have to be the starter, have to be out there, so they have to buy into what what we're trying to do. And and our team has bought in. They understand how important it is. Um, you know, once I tell them, you know, this is easier conversation for you down the line when you're a head pro somewhere, wherever you might go. Um, it's an easier conversation for you to have with somebody. So that's how they buy into it. And they understand uh, that data drives so much uh, nowadays, but um, the members response, it, it's, it's 50, 50. Um, you know, you give it to somebody that's really fast and they're like, well, I don't need it. Like I'm always under 410. Well, it helps our data. Um, so I'm going to give it to you. So that way you, you know, we can, we can track you just like we can track everybody else. Um, and then there's the misconception um, there's the, the education that we can do, you know, sometimes when we give this green pouch to somebody and clip it on the, the golf cart, they panic. They're like, Oh, you're watching me. Hey, this does, it just doesn't, doesn't work with me. I, I play, play worse when I have this, can you give it to someone else? Or when we pull the data and I, I show, show some of the data to somebody and I say, you know, out of the 34 rounds, you were, you were slow six times. You were a delayer six times. Well, when they see it, they're like, well, I didn't have the tag on my 
cart 34 times this year because I would actually grab it and I put it on somebody else's. Well, now it's the education of just because it's on yours doesn't mean I'm just tracking you, that sole individual. And then they don't, at the moment, don't quite understand how we can track individually, you know, so it's just education on our front, but the members see it, they understand uh, it's the members do appreciate it when we, when they have two or three guests with them, because then the starter is giving this, they're giving their spiel. Then they also hand over this green tag or tag it to, you know, the cart or give it to the caddy. And then, then it's an easy conversation to the guests of saying, there is a little, you know, eagle eye in the sky. We're watching you on your pace. So here's, if we, if we come find you, we have this data, we have this information um, and, and you need to need to pick it up. So that initial conversation, just handing it over uh, really sets the tone and, and make sure that our, our pace of play is, is imperative to us in the operation. I love that, Kyle, that the fact that someone said, you know, I play worse when I have this tag to my bag. So, you know, that, you know, we're all mental midgets when it comes to golf and, you know, and the things that we think about and the stereotypes is so funny, but uh, it's great that your, your team has, you know, embraced the culture and, and is, you know, continually learning how to, you know, communicate that to the membership because it is, it's uh, it's no different than a connotation of a marshal driving up. It's, Hey, you're tagging me, you're watching me. Why is that? You know, I'm not a slow player. So it's that negative connotation that you can address really abruptly and quickly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. I think um, it's much easier to have a 30 second education conversation. Of, this is what we're doing. And yes, we need data from everyone. Right. Because I know you're a fast player, but uh, I want to make sure that the group in front of you doesn't get in your way. And that's why I need your data, too much easier to have that conversation than to have the conversation that many, many club managers are having. And that's today was horrible. Uh, you played us five hours. Why did you do it to us again? You know, and, and the mop up that that creates and very often it, there's a culture and, and I, and I heard this the other day, the, um, uh, the, the quality of the pace is, is equal to the complaints that you might get about uh, the temperature of the beer or the quality of the, the free crisps on the clubhouse, right? <laughs> so if, if things don't work out so well out on the golf course and there's a flow issue, then uh, people remember everything else that they feel is wrong. Um, and they'll, uh, and if you don't have any data to, to back yourself and, uh, and to you know, keep the conversation non-confrontational, it can get quite uncomfortable. And obviously in the data fee space, very often, especially at um, at a high end place where you have really high expectations there's hundreds of complaints a season that saying i want my money back because this and this and this well if you have the track map very easy to dispel right um and uh, and it and it uh, yeah makes makes these conversations so much easier um gents i think we are almost at the end of our round here um i just wanted to throw out an opportunity for any questions that you might have um, to the audience, please um, type them in. We'll try and answer. There's a Q&A, there's a chat box. Um, I want to just pick up on one thing uh, while there might be a question or two. Um, you mentioned that you had a bit of a drought up in Minnesota. Um, this is obviously a common theme in the uh, Colorado River Basin all the way across to California where you used to work. Um, and uh, David, I know that uh, this, these are conversations that come up often for you and the team when it comes to can Tag Marshall help in the superintendent space at all. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the heat map and those sort of tools that are um, coming in handy when you have uh, water or uh, similar issues. Yeah, I, I think, but if you if you think about looking at the historical data of the track map, you can you can see the activity level, even Kyle's situation where you've got one person that's tracking and having the tag within the group, you know, if you got walkers and or carts that are that are driving the golf course, when you can have the visibility to where that activity level is, you can start seeing trends on the pattern of play on specific holes. So as an example, from an agronomic standpoint, if the right hand side of the third fairway gets very little play and you can see where literally 5% of the golfers are actually hitting it in that area, that might be an opportunity for you to cut the rough in a little bit more, less maintenance, less mode area, that type of thing. So, and it also of course set up when you start seeing the, the historical data of how the holes are playing time-wise, you, the superintendent can start getting, you know, the value of, 
you know, maybe this is the golf course setup. Maybe we've got a force carry here from this tee box. You know, it's an opportunity for them to look at pin placements. So it really, it really serves the purpose on the agronomic side to be able to manage the golf course more effectively, which is, as you can appreciate, will also promote pace of play yeah. because the golf course is set up, you know, you don't have a par five, you know, it, it doesn't happen much at Hazel team when you have an 8,000 yard golf course. But if you happen to have a par five that, you know, the younger players or the scratch group can play in the morning and they're hitting the par five and two. And so everybody's waiting on each other. That's going to create some havoc for you over time. So I think the overall visibility just gives you access to data that enables you to manage your entire operation better, whether it be pace, whether it be application on the golf course or, uh, or so, so forth. Um, Carl, we've got a question for you. In fact, it's two by Louis. Um, the first one is how far apart are your tee times? What's the interval? Uh, yeah, our current interval is 10 minutes. Um, and we, we start at 7.30 in the morning um, during the weekday. And then at, on the weekends, we start at 7.10. Mm -hmm. um, our, our intervals are, are 10 minutes. Um, we're, we're tee times always off the first um well I, I guess once a month we do jump on the back nine so our, our after hours league ladies at night um can can play nine holes on the back nine because otherwise they would never get to get to use it but uh, our intervals are, are 10 minutes uh, and it's a sweet spot for us i don't think we're gonna climb any any um you know pinch them tighter to eight minutes or, or move them to 10 i think it's a, it's a great great little sweet spot for us um, obviously, we work with a lot of uh, daily fee courses that are trying to um, squeeze out a little bit and they run eight, nine um, alternate intervals. Uh, we've also come across a, a course that during COVID had to mandate their tea times to 20 minute intervals. Um, obviously, that is a breeze to manage, right? Um, but you're losing half your inventory. <laughs> so, um, uh, that is obviously the the economic decision is we can we just push it out to 12 minutes and uh, and have less of a congestion risk well now you're losing 20 percent of your inventory right and then what's the cost of that versus um investing in management so you can actually get more out of it um and especially now at a time where there's such amazing um interest and and play volume coming everyone's way you have to make that count the next question also a good one how do you sanction members who are constantly slow Sure. Uh, again, a very difficult conversation to have uh, in our policies and procedures um, for for the members. Uh, our, our pace of play chart says, you know, you'll get a the very first time you'll get a verbal warning uh, about where you need to be. Um, and then if, if you don't improve, um, you know, on that second one, there may be an opportunity where we would position that individual or that group to where they should be. Um, and then the third time is is a mandatory um, move them to where they, they should be. Um, thankfully in, in my, in my time, I've never, um, moved anybody physically, you know, grabbed the six seater and, and moved them up a hole and a half, but we do have those in our policies and procedures manual. Um, so again, just another, another bullet point to us to be able to say, look, this is approved by golf committee. It's approved by the board. Uh, we're just acting on, on their behalf. Um, but then the other side of it, uh, you know, once we do have this whole list of the delayers, um, uh, this winter, uh, we just closed up. So this winter, I'll take that chart um, and, and that information, that data, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick out, you know, certain people that I know are, as we, as we call them, as others do as well, but uh, human rain delays. Um, we will certainly talk to them. We'll have in-person conversations. Uh, we won't send them a violation. We'll just make sure that we we go and, and just talk to them and just educate them and because maybe they don't know you know they yeah. <clears throat> same ones we're always going out and driving out and talking to um, but they just don't understand where they actually fall uh, if you're averaging over 415 or 60 percent of your rounds or delay rounds it's my responsibility to make sure that we're we're having the educational conversation with them so I'll pull them in this winter uh, or if they're not around if they if they they're snowbirds and they fly yeah. away. Um, for winter, I'll, I'll give them a call and, and just have an educational um, meeting with them. And then, as, as you said, with that data, um, being able to pick from year to year um, and seeing the improvement that somebody may, you know, I'll take the same data next year. 
if I had a conversation with them and they had 20 rounds that were delay rounds. And then after the conversation this winter, they go to five or 10. Great. The improvement is there. If they do the same or get worse, then there might be something that we have to have to do. And, and maybe their um, guest play privileges, they can play a max of three players. Um, maybe they play after two o'clock if they have guests, you know, those types of things. Um, you just, you just hopefully don't have to have happen, but, but it's, it, it could. You know, Kyle, yeah. if you think about it in the, in the spirit of, I know what you're trying to do every day is to improve the experience and have people have fun playing the game. It, mm -hmm. The result of that may be that realization that, you know what, it's time for me to move up a tee or mm -hmm. it's time for me, you know what, I know I've been slower this year because I've really been struggling in my golf game. You know, let us facilitate some instruction, yeah. you know, that type of thing. So there's there's great opportunities to not to turn that into a very positive. And the next year they speed up play because they're now playing from the set of tees that they should have been playing from. So. Yeah, it, correct. Uh, great, great point there, David. And, it, you know, you mentioned that and it's actually perfect timing because right now I'm I'm adjusting our combo tee. Um, some players that play the gold tee at, at 67, um, hundred yards, they just can't, you know, the carries are different for them. So now we have a, we've had a gold white combo tee. Uh, but when you look at the photo, um, of that slideshow there, that the top hole is our, our fame 16, uh, which is the par four along Lake Hazeltine. Uh, but there's a little stretch of, of the, just after the, the tee box where it's a, it's a decent force carry for some individuals. So I'm, I'm looking at moving that from what is the combo T you play the gold T there, move it to the white. We're going to save a few, a few yards. Um, but again, this data too is, is very important on that front because 16 is a very challenging hole. So anything that we can do for them to a understand that it's a hard hole, um, but find ways to make it not necessarily easier for them, uh, but find ways to help improve pace of play. And the force carry is a simple one. You know, we can just move move the tees forward or, or change that combo tee for them. Yeah, uh, great point. And the nice thing is that uh, you'll be able to test it, right? What does the data tell me? Is it working, right? And, uh, and then if it does, okay, do more of that. Uh, but uh, to your point, um, David, the instruction side, it's its about positioning, right? Like we don't want to say slow, we can say out of position or can you catch up half a hole? It's the same thing here. Like I know that there's a lot of pros that are really worried about having the sensitive conversation with, with members because what if this person then stops booking instruction with me, you know? On the reverse side, you can make it um, uh, educational and say, hey, looking at your track map, I see that you're always falling out of position on this hole. Um, maybe I can help you uh, manage the course better. You know, let's uh, let's book a session. So you can actually turn it around um, and uh, and assist rather than um, rather than reprimand. So I think that's a good uh, parting thought um, we are over time and uh, it is my job to keep us on time so but it was great questions and everyone's still here thank you so much or to our guests um kyle we are yeah, delighted to have you on thank you so much uh, we're hoping uh, to get to see your glorious course in action at uh, next year's amateur uh, and all the best for that and uh, yeah do enjoy your break um and hope to you get to play a bit of golf in the south um as uh, as the year progresses and into the new year yeah awesome well thank you so much for having me really look forward to um again having these these fun conversations with the data that you guys have have, have given us so thank you for having me and i uh, look forward to doing more of these in the future with you all right kyle thanks yes. so much for the conversation it was awesome really really great speaking with you awesome well, right. david so much thanks everyone